I'm Josh Barrow, host of Left, Right, and Center, KCRW's weekly forum for civilized debate across the political spectrum. Today's news cycle demands more time for deeper analysis. So Left, Right, and Center is now a full hour every week. Subscribe and listen at kcrw.com slash LRC. On To The Point, we try to make sense of the policy debates and the political sideshows on the campaign trail. You have this kind of asymmetrical warfare coming from a guy who's great at a soundbite, lousy at an answer. So are you looking for your own billionaire? No, no, I don't want my own billionaire. I'm going to raise the vast majority of the money. Brace yourself, America, for what? King Trump. (laughs) I'm Warren Altney. To The Point has you covered for the 2016 campaign. Find the To The Point podcast on KCRW's iTunes page. From KCRW Santa Monica and KCRW.com, it's The Treatment. Welcome to The Treatment. I'm Elvis Mitchell. It was probably 30 years ago this year that Lethal Weapon first began shooting. My guest, Shane Black, who we know from The Last Boy Scout and Iron Man 3 and many other films. Uh, his newest film as writer-director, I should also say one of my favorite films of the last decade, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, which is his first film as writer-director. His newest film as writer-director is, of course, The Nice Guys. Shane, first of all, welcome so much. Thanks for being here. It's, it's, I've known you for a while, and I've just been looking for a good opportunity to come in. This is terrific. It's good for me, too. Give the audience a little taste of what The Nice Guys is. It's mm. set in 1978. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I, I want to do. I could do detective films pretty much exclusively, probably until the day I die. So this was a chance to do that, and it was a sort of window onto an era in the '70s when I, if you were in, were in LA in 1979 or '78, the smog was so bad they actually had essentially sirens, like air raid sirens that would go off, and kids would have to go indoors. They'd say, "Hey, come on, don't let your kids play ball, or if you, if they go outside, just make sure that it's after six o'clock." So the at night. smogglers we heard about back east. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The SIG alert was the actual volume of traffic, but the smog alert would drive you indoors because as you flew into L.A., coming from another place in the country, you'd go through a brown crust of just dirt smog. And people knew it. They knew that L.A. was just this basin with this crust on top, like a souffle. Similarly, Hollywood Boulevard, you couldn't let your kids walk down at that time because it was a sex pit. It was a cesspool. Every other storefront was XXX. And so there's this sort of dilapidated, faded you know, American dreams, still the destination, by the way, of every, you know, coast crossing, you know, dreamer to get to the edge of the planet, the edge of the coast here in L.A., but the Hollywood sign was in tatters and no one was doing anything about it. In fact, your film starts with the Hollywood sign in tatters. That's right. So you've got this real sort of perfect, picture-perfect backdrop for this sort of seedy kind of story interspersed with moments of actual sort of romance and glamour that... I, I think that's what Kiss Kiss Bang Bang was. I think in a way this is more that sort of tone. The characters are different, but it's more like a spiritual cousin to that first film. But as you're talking about these elements, these are things that in all your films. Hollywood is a destination in every film you've written almost, with the exception of Iron Man 3. Every film you've written on your own, this is a destination, isn't it? It really is the jumping off point where you sort of show up all you know, bright-eyed and full of this wonderful sense of uh, purpose and destination and destiny only to find out after a few years you sort of look around you know, sun blinded and you know head spun and and you just come to this horrible understanding that destiny isn't quite for you it was for that other dude you know but at some point in almost all your movies too somebody walks into a hollywood party an, an archetypal hollywood yes. party <laughs> i i i love hollywood parties as a device i've attended a few but also just the the desperation that we experience here in los angeles you're standing in line to get into a club and there's always the one guy who just walks right in. You're, you're standing there, but some guy goes, hey, Mike, how you doing? And he walks right in past everybody. And the obsession of everyone in that line is to somehow gravitate culturally to the place where they're the one who gets to do that. Why am I in line and that guy's not? And it becomes more important than anything that's happening inside that club. Because you go in, there's no one there. It's just, you know, three old guys playing cards in the corner. But in the meantime... Just the obsession with how can I stay upwardly mobile. There was even a theory at one point that L.A., there were serial killers coming from L.A. because it represents the westernmost bastion of the American dream. You can be anything you want here. You can come from a lower income family, you know, in a barrio and be president. Other countries don't have that because it's a caste system. But that's something that runs throughout everything you've done, even Iron Man, through the idea of reinvention. Yes. Somebody reinventing himself. 
Is that something you can relate to in, in terms of your coming here and sort of reinventing yourself? Is that why that's so recurrent a theme in your work? Yeah, I've been, I've been lucky because, you know, every, everybody who works in the business is to some extent, I think, feel, has feelings of fraudulence. I'm no exception. And the, the notion that a chapter may be ending very soon unless you're extremely careful. You may slide off the map. And I've come very close many times in Hollywood to just becoming gone, a non-entity. And the reinvention and the discovery that other chapters exist, which may be different, but in some ways better than the previous one, has been very profound a discovery for me. So I love writing stories about guys who get knocked down and have to find some reason to drag themselves up to, so that, you know, here they are standing, their feet under them once again. How does that happen? What is it that, you know, triggers that that nascent faith that we all have, that flickering little fire that's almost out, the pilot light that's inside of, of us that can almost get to the point where it flickers out, but something is available to somehow stoke it back to life again. And I think the task of movies like this, these sort of Paul Heroic movies, is to get that flame as low as it can go, take them through the most destitute, awful place you can, and then find what, if anything, you can do so that that flame starts to flicker again. And you see it in E.T., you know, the famous thing where E.T.'s dead and then that light just starts to flicker in his chest again, you know? And it's like, yes, it's not quite out. It's not quite extinguished, you know? But that's funny because I didn't realize until seeing Kiss Kiss Bang Bang how much, if you pardon the expression, Pulp Fiction impacted you as a writer. Hmm. But Pulp was clearly, I mean, <clears throat> more so I think the movies even, Pulp had a big impact on the way you write, didn't it? Absolutely. My friends and I were, were big fans of, you know, all the... Uh, old pulp superheroes like Doc Savage, The Shadow. But more than that, there was this sort of unsung uh, line of, of books, this legacy from the 50s and 60s. So it wasn't just Ross McDonald and Chandler. There are all these guys you forget about, these lurid sort of paperback covers painted by, you know, uh, Robert McGinnis. And Frank Frazetta even did some of them. Yeah. And these guys churned out these books that I gobbled up as a kid. I was a lonely kid. I just did nothing but read. But there was a promise in those covers, what wasn't oh. there? I mean, the, 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 somehow the book never delivered on the cover. <laughs> well, in a way, even Doc Savage, which I love, you know, the, sometimes the stories weren't that great. You just end up staring at the cover, you know, because it was the most amazing uh, pulp artist, James Bama, who did those. And you're right, though. It's evocative in a way that any one book may fail you. Any one book may not live up to it. But as a whole, that sea of books with all those covers of all those pointed guns and ladies perched on desks with their blouse open, you know, there's just a wonderful sea of stuff there, a stew that you just want to sink into and participate in. And that idea of that that hero who, but that, that Chandler ethos pervaded all those books. There's that one guy who basically thought his compass was pointed towards Magnetic North, even when it wasn't. Yeah. You like that guy too, don't you? <clears throat> I, I very much like that guy. In fact, you know, you might argue there's two genres which are pretty much solely American. They're endemic just to the United States. One is the cowboy and the other is the hard-boiled private eye. And they're very similar to the extent that that kind of frontier justice, that kind of walking into a situation and disassembling it and putting it back together with your own rules and your own sense of morality and who gets what and who gets saved and who gets punished. Those authors back then, they'd write, in the 30s or 40s, they'd write a Western and then they'd write a private eye novel. They'd go back and forth because there was no difference. One's in the West, one's current day. But they're all Westerns in a way. It's the treatment. We're talking to Shane Black, whose new film is writer director is The Nice Guys. And I, I guess uh, a couple of years ago, I did an event with you at the LA Film Festival. And I told you the thing I found so fascinating is that your films are so often about guys who are basically at the end of their rope and they take place during the holidays. Hmm. And this is the first time that really hasn't happened, but it's still about two guys kind of at the, at the end, emotionally yeah. at the end of their rope. Yeah, it's a heightened kind of feel that uh, the characters. You know, you don't want to come upon them just at any point in their life. The test, I think, and, and you know this for a screenplay, is why now? Why this? Why do you come upon them at this point in their lives? It can't just be random. You make a movie about it because theoretically this is the most important thing that will ever happen to that character. That's why we're making the movie. Otherwise, we'd just be doing episodes. And the problem with all the sequels is you make a movie which is supposedly about the most important thing ever to happen to your characters, your lead... And then you have to do a sequel. Well, 
but now it's not going to be the most important thing. The great thing I find about private detective stuff is that by virtue of the fact that there'll always be another case, you can always give them more revelation. You can always give, you can let the detective see crazier things. It used to be, starting out, that the detective in his detective story, it was about the mystery he solved and the things he brought to light and the crazy sort of secrets he was able to sort of unearth. And then about, I'd say in the 80s or so, it became all about the detective's cat and, you know, their quirks and their romances and their landlord is always chasing them and the car they drive and they have a pet parrot named Bart, you know, and all this sort of thing. Where's the mystery anymore? There's suddenly these character studies. I thought, no, I like the plotting. I like the sense that the detective, yeah, we got to have great characters, but what does he look at? What is the thing that he solves that wrenches us and leaves him a changed person for having witnessed it, for having seen it? And dared to put his finger in and unravel that. Because even what you did with Iron Man 3, which makes it, to me, a Shane Black movie, it's, it's finally about shoe leather. It's about him keeping on the move and, and breaking this thing, isn't it? it it's a mystery. I, I like to look at it like that, that he, he does an investigation. Now, I've actually gotten death threats over Iron Man 3. It did very well, by the way. Because it didn't feel like a Marvel movie to some people? <sighs> there is an online contingent that is so upset about the Mandarin and the twist where he wasn't really a big villain, he was sort of a cobbled together boogeyman, you know, a think tank made him up. But you, you managed to turn that into a Shane Black piece because it's, you know, in, in, uh, in, in, in The Long Kiss Good Night, it's, it's, it's Sam Jackson, but it's always somebody who's willing to do the boring work that I associate with pulp. Interesting, yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons I like talking to people like you is if you parrot things back to me, I say, oh yeah, you're right, you're right, that is true. It, it, it's really the unsung hero who uh, has skills that he doesn't know he has is, is something that I like a lot. There's something to be said for someone who's so good at what they do that you can't help but admire them. That's Mel Gibson in Lethal Weapon. That's Gina Davis in Long Kiss Goodnight. But there's the other guy who, in the pairing who doesn't know he's as good as he'll be forced to become. And that, to me, is, is very interesting. But I, I just, watching things to get ready for this, that idea, that, that, that concept of the person who's willing to be Val Kilmer in, mm -hmm. in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, the guy who's willing right. to put in the footwork, the guy who will do whatever it takes, who will knock on each door and go through each document, that idea of just putting in the work, it's almost like you bring your own ethos, your own, your own work ethos into these films. Well, because it's a skill set that isn't obvious, let's say. A guy who can pull out a gun and, you know, fire, shoot the guns out of seven different people's hands, that's pretty obvious. But a guy who knows how to be a detective and what to look up and how to find things and how to intuit things about people who say, no, if he's saying this, what he really means is this. Those are guys who have experience. They've just seen and done it enough that they have a wealth of knowledge about just the intricacies of stuff. They can navigate. And I really like the characters who are plotters. They're kind of losers in a way, but they've seen enough that they're very good at navigating, even if they just get by. And on a good day, when they can recall when they once were on fire, you know, when that flame was still bright, you realize they were not just good at navigating. These guys are really something. And they've reached an era of disappointment in their life where they don't think it's going to happen for them anymore. But they still haven't stopped doing what they but do, they though. still haven't stopped doing it. So, in a way, the, the interesting character for me is, is the actor who was a star and now is just doing occasional TV roles. They're still acting, but they're not the star anymore. And maybe there's a chapter for them that they will be. But as far as they know, the decline is pretty much irreversible at this point. But there's still a love of craft that keeps them going. And, and then I would say that's the case for certainly the, the Russell Crowe character here in The Nice yeah. Guys. It's these guys who understand that if you keep at it, it will pay off. Pride in the job, yeah. Which also strikes me as being a distinctly and peculiarly American kind of thing. Yeah. There's a story about Lee Marvin. I don't know if it's true. So I don't want to quote it, but... It, what I heard was that Lee Marvin, towards the end of his career, would come in around 6 in the morning, bluff, hail and hearty, you know, slapping everyone on the back and say, say to the director, hey, this is going to be fun. I'm, I'm good, but just know I'll give you everything I got, but by noon I'm going to be in the bag. And he would know, and the director would know, that by noon, okay, it's time to stop now and get a couch for Lee, you know, that sort of thing. And the next morning he comes in at 6 and he's fine again. 
it takes a toll. And I love the notion of the toll that things take on people who still have all their skills, but they've been worn down. Well, we'll take a break because time's taking a toll on us. I'm here with Shane Black. <laughs> His newest film is writer director. It's the nice guys. It's the treatment. There's more to come. Stay with us. This podcast is produced by nonprofit radio station KCRW. KCRW relies on member support to help keep our programming fresh and authentic. Find out how you can donate at kcrw.com slash join. Welcome back. It's The Treatment. I'm here with Shane Black. Finally got him on the show. And I met, did I meet you at the uh, Austin Film Festival? Like it may have been. I, and, I, and you were saying that you actually, you were, you were taking some time off. You were spending some time with Jim Brooks. You were yeah. actually trying to sort of, you, as you put it, remind yourself why you were writing screenplays. Yeah. Well, it got bad at a point because I was making a great deal of money in the 90s writing screenplays. And not to the detriment of scripts. I think they were fairly well written, the things I was selling. But other people were very upset by it. Because? I don't know. Maybe because I made money, a lot of money. I'll give you an example. My friend Dale Lawner is a wonderful writer. I know Dale. Yeah. He said, hey, Shane, you know, why don't I uh, sponsor you into the Film Academy? You could vote on the Oscars, you know, and I said, that sounds like fun. I'd like to vote. And uh, so he got two people, and they did a petition to get me. In. And uh, I think the criteria at that time was you had to have two produced credits of substantive merit. And I got a letter back from them saying, you know, uh, we've reviewed your application and we don't feel you're appropriate this time for membership in the academy, but perhaps when you have more credits, you can reapply. And I had Lethal Weapon, Last Boy Scout, Last Action Hero, Long Kiss Kid Night. I had like Lethal Weapon 2, you know, five big movies and, and things. And most of those are solo credits. Yeah, and things that grossed a billion dollars, but they rejected me from the academy. And in fact, uh, Jim, who was a good guiding force for me at that time, he... Uh, he actually quit the writer's branch over that. Wow. I showed him a letter, and he said, fine, I quit. So I continued to work with him because I believed in Jim. I believed that he was unique. He was a powerful writer who took the time to, you know, if he wanted to do a story about guys in a diner, he'd go work at one because he wasn't recognizable to most people. And I wanted to do a romantic comedy to prove to everybody. I'm not just that action. I'm going to write a charming Woody Allen-like piece, you know, and I have to style it after Jim Brooks. And 80 pages in, Jim came to me and said, dude, there's good stuff in here, but it's, it's all over the place, man. Where, where are you going with this? I don't, and I was crushed. My idol looked at my work and said, not only are you failing to deviate from the action stuff, you know, with this romantic comedy that's not very good, but you've written 80 pages of Drek and haven't even noticed along the way that it was off track. I was devastated. But I went back in and I said, you know, there is good stuff here. And so... I thought finally to myself, I, I got to do it. I got to put a murder in it and a detective, and then I can write it. And that's how Kiss Kiss Bang Bang started, was that it was half detective story and half romantic comedy. And it's the hybrid of the comedy I tried to write but could not until I stopped being pretentious and said, dude, you're not Jim Brooks. Just put the damn murder in it. Put the gay detective in that you wanted to put in and just make it a mystery. And then it all fell together. It's the treatment. We're talking to Shane Black, who rediscovered that his strengths are his strengths, and his strengths are extant in the new film, The Nice Guys, which, first of all, where's that title come from? I don't know. That was literally 1986, well, when I was leaving for Predator. We just would joke about doing it. Which you're in as an actor, Predator, in addition yeah, to having some rewrite work on. But my friends and I would joke about a film called The Nice Guys, you know, and it, we would do a fake trailer for it in our heads where you just saw these guys, you know, roaming around doing this capery stuff and they were the nice guys. So it was kind of a weird experiment. A buddy of mine in 2001 said, hey, let's, let's do the nice guys. I'll write one character, you write the other. And that was my friend Anthony Bagarosi. And uh, we, so we basically concocted a script that went nowhere, set in present day. Then in 2005, we tried it as a television show for CBS and that went nowhere. What was their objection to it? Back oh, then? It's, there's just no standards and practices. Everything in the script I liked had a big line through it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it, as I'm watching this one, though, it's just funny because it, it feels like it's, it's almost this kind of sort of reduction 
of, of everything you've done. Everything's sort of boiled down. You've got the two characters who at this point are almost kind of extremes. Yeah. One really is an idiot, yeah. and the other really <laughs> is the guy who's just basically a kind of all impulse and smarter than the other guy and completely in the background. I mean, mm-hmm. he does get led into the club in front of other people, but that's only because he lives in the same building, so he's not a glamorous guy. Right. But ostensibly, he's walking past all the people who's standing in that line. And the young woman, and there's so often a young woman who ends up being sacrificed <laughs> at the beginning of your movies, <laughs> and a kid who's smarter than everybody else. Yeah, I guess when you say it that way... I'm just saying this... To but isn't that, it interesting? Because I, I think it is true that you don't sit down and plan it. Okay. You, just, you, you just sort of put these elements that interest you, and then you realize you're sort of hitting the same elements, that there are certain common threads that you tend to gravitate toward. In the same way that one of the ways that I write that I recommend to young writers is I'll have a shoebox under the bed. And if, if I have a line of dialogue that pops in my head during dinner, I'll write it and throw it in the shoebox. Idea for a scene. And I do this for six months. And I'll maybe throw in a piece of paper every day or two. So by the end, I've got a shoebox full of paper scraps. And I dump it out and I sift through them and I look for the common thread, the thing I kept coming back to, the thing that seems to make a pattern, you know. And I'll realize, geez, you know, I guess all this random stuff is suggesting to me that what I really want to do is something like this. Because, you know, 75% of the paper pertains to it. The other 25 is is nil. But more often than not, you'll get a sense of what you want just in the aggregate. But it's interesting to me because I'm just saying this today that in watching all the movies, the lethal weapon starts in a way that's not dissimilar to the way Nice Guy starts. But it's a pulp novel opening. It's completely a pulp. It could be the dreadful lemon sky. It could be any number sure. of pulps. Yeah. And I just thought, oh, my God, why did this never occur to me before Kiss, Kiss, Bang, Bang, or even yeah. Long Kiss, Good Night, that you were doing an homage to pulp? Right. It's Because not... nobody's actually, no, when people do pulp, they sort of neglect what makes it work on the page. And, and, and what you did was by just creating your own pulp, you found a way to sort of bring those elements to work on a page and make them work on the screen. Well, it's, it's, it's very kind of you to say that. I think that most people, when they set out to write a movie like that, they'll look at the legacy of just a few films like Night Moves, Dirty Harry, or Bullet, or something. But I had the advantage of not just those available movies, but, you know, a backlog of like I said, a thousand pulp novels in my library. And detective stories, you know, from the time I saw Farewell, My Lovely, my first R-rated movie, when I was, uh, you know, 17, 16 years old in Pittsburgh. And it's not even perfect. It's not, but I just remember thinking and watching it going, the narration's really cool. It's just got a snap to it. And he makes jokes and stuff. I wonder if the book's like that. Is there really a voice this interesting that narrates an entire book? And so I got, and I realized this is what I've been missing was a narrator who was that cool, clever, hip, slick, funny, and soulful, and that they were all available to me. So from the time I was 16 years old, I just snapped these things up, you know. As watching this, these things, so I just thought, again, with Kiss. Kiss, get bang, bang, and then going back and watching them. I was like, wow, that's, that's what it is. He's been doing pulp. And, and the fact there's so many times that people would do these, buy these pulp books and do them, like Point Blank mm-hmm. or the Ross McDonald, which I actually I like that, the, the, that Rod Taylor movie, is yeah. st- Darker Than Amber, is still not the book. Right. And, and but also keeping in mind there's the thing that Elmore Leonard got from those books, that they, people are funny, but they're not trying to be funny. Yes, of course. I mean, that's where the, the, really, the, the, real, the rubber really hits the road, isn't it? They are writing characters who aren't cracking jokes, but are funny anyway. Yeah, and it's it's also the sort of throwaway joke, like the showing up in the morning to a crime scene with a dead body. Bosch does it pretty well, I think, where they're just slinging lines back and forth, and they're not stopping. They're not saying them and waiting for the laugh. They're busy. They got to do, but along the way, it's like, hey, how's, how's the wife, Harry? I mean, as a snake, Joe, you know, it's that kind of Walter Hill rhythm. Exactly. That thing, though, where the, the, the comedy comes out of character rather mm-hmm. than using comedy to make characters. Right, exactly. I mean, it's, it, it's the difference maybe between television and the movie. Well, it brings up an interesting point because this is, a, this is one of my failings. If you give me an assignment, if you hand me a thriller and say, here's, here's a thriller, put some jokes in it. I go, okay, sure. But if you say, here's some blank pages, write me a comedy, I'm, I'm frozen. I cannot sit down with a blank page and think, okay, here's my comedy that I'm writing. But if I think of it as a thriller or a caper or an adventure, and I know it has to have a through line of something terse and edgy, the jokes will come. But I can't imagine sitting down to write Neighbors 2 
our competition, by the way, for the uh, the May film audience. I think the audiences are a little bit different, but let me ask you this, because this is now the th your third film as, as director. What was it like your first day directing? It was interesting because, you know, preparation's everything, and so I was just so nervous, and I felt even if I'm doing too much preparation, better than worrying about on set that I did too little. So we knew all the angles, you know, we'd go this way, and then the character walks over here, okay, that's a new axis. So we, we set up, you know, basically we'll film this way and this way, wide shot over the swimming pool on top of the standard hotel. And then it's pretty much just the interactions of these characters. They started delivering gold. They started just, Robert Downey and Val Kilmer did a brilliant scene that day. And I called my friend Peter Hyams, who was actually a wonderful old time director, old school guy. Busting among other things. Yeah. And I said, Peter, thanks for the tips first off on directing. He says, no problem. I said, but I'm scared, man. I, he goes, why? Because it was too easy. I sat at the monitor, I laughed. I told the guy, I said, good job, you know, try something. I, I, I didn't do anything. It was just fine. And he goes, are you a schmuck? What are you talking about? Shut the f*** up and go back to your job directing, you know, it's supposed to be fun. Talk about casting Russell Crowe and, and Ryan Gosling for this. Well, that was pretty interesting because we made one last push to get this, you know, desiccated corpse of a script, you know, reanimated somehow. It was just sitting there for so long. For and is this basically the script that you shot, that you wrote in 2001? <clears throat> we, we changed it to put it in the 70s. 70s, okay. Yeah. And that was the one that did get some more, a little bit of a better response, but still, no one was making the movie. And then Ryan Gosling's agent came to us and said, hey, Brian just read it, you know, and uh, it just seems like the kind of thing he wants to do. And I had the agency. I was on the phone to the, the agent for Russell Crowe, and he, Russell said, wait, Ryan, I want to work with him. If he's doing it, I'll do it. And it, it, it literally came together in three days after 13 years. We just put it out there, and three days later, we had our cast. So it's one of those bizarre things where we tried forever to get this thing up and running, and it miraculously just sort of happened when it was supposed to happen. Well, tell me, too, because so often there's a, a kid who's a little bit smarter than he or she should be mm. in your movies. So where does that, that character come from for you? Is that kid you in the movie? Maybe, maybe not. I tend to think it's just a case of, like, everybody has, in in this sort of corrupted world, you want fresh eyes. You want eyes that are, I like kids who are cynical beyond their years, like they've been exposed to things that make them less than kids. Their childhood was notoriously short. But at the same time, because they're kids, there's a wonderful thing that happens where they're just so impervious. Kids are so resilient. If you talk to psychologists about kids who've even been through tremendous abuse, and you say, how do those kids do when they get to be teenagers? They say, well, you know what? They actually do pretty well. You know, so the kids are amazingly resilient. They have a lot of traumas and things, but they, they manage to muddle through. And I'm a fan of putting kids in dangerous situations because it's an identification thing. When I was watching Johnny Quest as a kid, I remember thinking, I don't like these shows with kids in them where there's no real danger. I want to feel like I'm in the world with the big boys, with the adults. And Johnny Quest gave us that. He was a kid, but his dad he, his, was an actual scientist. His bodyguard was Race Bannon, you know, and people died. And so the idea of an adventure experienced through the eyes of a kid that is sophisticated enough and adult enough to feel like you weren't cheated as a kid. You're, you're not being led into the, the bargain sort of safe version of it. You know, we give the kid the credit of being, you know, in on the ride with the big boys. We're out of time, Shannon. I can't thank you enough for doing this. Thanks so much. Oh, no, thank you, Elvis. That's terrific. Thank you. My pleasure. My guest who's rehearsing for his live-action version of Johnny Quest is Shane Black. His newest <laughs> film as writer-director is a nice guy. So recording engineer here at NPR West is Peter Sessel. The show is mixed by Kat York. It's edited by Blake Fight, who's associate producer. I'm not one of the nice guys. It's the treatment. <laughs> Catch up on past episodes of the treatment, go to KCRW.com or listen on your smartphone with KCRW's mobile apps or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or if you listen to podcasts. The treatment is produced and distributed by KCRW Santa Monica. That I think.